So good morning. My uh, name is Pedro Mokrian. I'm an adjunct professor here at Stanford. Um, and I focus on entrepreneurship in the world of uh, energy and the built environment. And uh, I'm so delighted to be the moderator for this uh, discussion this morning because we're going to try to do something slightly different. Um, Traditionally, we've done a lot of panels in this conference, and what we're trying to do this time is actually do TED-style talks um, by having some of the, the leading minds when it comes to understanding what the future of energy looks like um, present to you their vision and their world um, as they see it on a daily basis. But before we do that, I'm just going to take you through just a couple of slides to kind of anchor this. And one of the things that I've always found interesting is the interlinkage between the built environment and economic efficiency. So here we are looking at um, the world in 1980. And on the corner down there, you can see China and India in terms of the overall economic output that those countries have. And in a few short years, you can sort of see how the GDP growth is going for those ecosystems and those economies. And it really has to do with the linkage between the percentage of the population that is living in dense urban environments, the drive of technology to connect us all, and economic efficiency. So the built environment and economic output are, are tightly interlinked. But what does that mean over the next few years? So according to the International Energy Association, we're going to have a vastly different world over the next two decades. In fact, despite the fact that they're projecting the United States and Europe to actually have far less energy intensity, we're seeing a lot of growth in other parts of the world. And to put that into perspective, we're looking at just electricity demand in these different regions. And we're seeing China over the next couple of years, a couple of decades, I should say, effectively add the same amount of capacity as we have in the United States. That's a lot of infrastructure. That's a lot of demand for new types of technologies and new types of thinking. And so what we want to do is we want to think about this in terms of the context of technology. Technology is going to be the driving force for not only allowing us to reduce our intensity to continue to grow, but also to provide the next generation of infrastructure required in these emerging markets. So I have two examples here in terms of solar and batteries, and obviously all of these are driven down by technological advancements to reduce costs. However, that's not the only thing. The future is a lot of different technologies in terms of a portfolio both on the generation side, on the management side, and the supply side, the demand side. And so we're so excited today to have six young entrepreneurs from Cyclotron Road at Berkeley come to us today to actually present what they view to be the future. So we have the future of solar, batteries, lighting, HVAC, generation, and synthetic biology. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Colin, who's going to begin our conversation today by talking to us about the future of solar. All right. Thanks, Pedro, for the nice introduction. I'm Colin Bailey. Uh, Stanford PhD and founder of Tandem PV. And usually in front of an audience like this, I'd be asking, uh, what can you do for solar? And ideally, uh, what can you do for Tandem PV? But today I want to ask the question from a completely different lens and ask, uh, what can solar do for you that it's not already doing? Solar panels don't look much different today than they did 70 years ago. But they're far more powerful now and they're incredibly less expensive. And that's allowed them to fill applications in markets as they become economically viable to do so. In the beginning of solar's long and grand history, the only place where it was economically viable to put them was in outer space, where cost was no object. But sort of as solar became cheaper, then they came down to Earth through government-sponsored pilot projects, and uh, subsidies. And these really got solar's manufacturing legs underneath them, such that now, incredibly today, solar is cheap enough to start uh, providing alternative solutions to thermal power plants. And for most of the world, 
solar can continue to provide solutions to thermal power plants for the next decade or two without too much of a problem. But then, of course, the rest of the world is going to meet the problems that California is already fet facing today, because we're so forward-looking here. And they're going to need grid-scale energy storage in order to really enable higher penetrations of solar on the grid. And for grid-scale energy storage, I'm going to assume that my colleagues at Cyclotron Road are going to fix that problem. So if solar plus storage becomes economically viable, then what else can solar do? And I think the next thing that solar is going to do is get rid of the grid itself. Two of the advantages of solar are its modularity and its distributed energy generation. So you can put as much solar as you need, where you need it, right where you're going to use the power. And it means that uh, power plants like coal power plants are perhaps an antiquated idea of how we get our electricity around the world. And there's a couple of reasons you might want to get rid of the electrical grid as we know it. And for the sake of brevity, I'll just mention two. In order to keep the electrical grid functioning sort of as the status quo over the next couple decades carries a price tag of a couple of trillion dollars. And that doesn't include any modernization or upgrades in order to uh, advance the grid to be able to handle large uh, amounts of renewable electricity on the grid. And the other cost perhaps uh, another cost perhaps keenly felt by Californians is externalities. And the externality here in California is wildfires. And over the last few years, many wildfires have been caused by the grid. And not to say that getting rid of the grid will get rid of the wildfires, but just as a point of contention, the total price tag for the 2017 wildfires is approaching $180 billion. And if you took today's market prices for solar and today's market prices for battery storage and you completely supplied 100% of California's electricity needs by those two methods, then that's equivalent to the cost of three seasons or so of fire. And so solar plus storage is already becoming uh, a viable economic option. And so those may not be convincing arguments for you to get rid of the electrical grid, but let's just pretend for the rest of this that I was a convincing guy and you believe that uh, the electrical grid should uh, find an alternative solution. And if that were the case, then perhaps neighborhoods would start to look like this, that there would be solar on every rooftop and there would be batteries in every basement. And for for neighborhoods to look like this, you may want the individual houses to be self-sufficient, to create as much electricity as they use. And the question, therefore, is can solar do that today? And if you're the average American family in an average American house using an average American amount of electricity in an average American uh, sunlight location, then the answer is, yeah, you can do that today. And it's pretty amazing that with just 15% or so efficient solar panels blanketed on your rooftop, you can account over the course of the year for all of your electricity needs. But if you take the long view, then perhaps there's a future where uh, we electrify everything. And if we electrify everything, then there's other grids besides the electrical grid. There's the natural gas grid that's used for uh, space heating and water heating in your home. And there's the transportation grid, the gasoline grid. And so if you additionally want to account for uh, electrical heating on your home, then you need 25% efficient solar panels. And that becomes a problem because you can't buy 25% efficient solar panels today. And it's unlikely you'll ever be able to buy 25% efficient solar panels using the line of sight of commodity technologies. But then if you want to have two electric vehicles that drive the average American's distance every year, then you need, on top of that, 35% efficient solar panels. And that becomes a real big problem because not only are you unlikely to get there, 
But with today's technology platforms, it's fundamentally impossible for you to reach, achieve those performance thresholds. And the only way to get to 25 or 35 percent efficient, efficient solar panels is to bring another technology from space down to Earth. And those are tandem solar panels. And fundamentally, tandem solar panels simply combine two different solar materials which are designed to absorb separate parts of the sunlight and in combining uh, provide more power than either of the two by themselves. And so this is a path by which you can see your way to a future with no electrical grid, no natural gas grid, and no gasoline grid. And this may not be the future that we're headed towards, but if we head towards this future, if this is a desirable future, then it will include tandem solar panels. Thanks.